Dear students, we are going to start the introductory lecture of MSc 694. Welcome to this class. You know, because of the pandemic, COVID-19, we have to resort to video lectures. And this is very unfortunate that we can't have face-to-face -face contact with you. And hence, we, I have to resort to recording all my lectures so that you can access it easily from your home or from your place, wherever you are, and see it whenever you feel it. You can always watch these videos as your, at your own time, at your own pace. You don't need to worry about me coming in front of you. Okay, so let's start. This is the course on nanostructure and nanomaterials, characterization and properties. This is a three lectures course. That means we'll have three contact hours per week, having credits of 27. So that means every week we'll got you are got to see three lectures. And because semester is 13 semester, 13 week long, so that means you will have about 39 to 40 lectures for this course. That makes the course pretty intensive and which you should follow very rigorously. As you understand, this is an advanced level course, 600 level. As well also, the matter of the course is very new. So hence, you require to spend time to understand it. First, let me talk about myself. I am a professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering. My office in Western Lab, room number 210. My internal phone number is 6184. But if you want to call me from outside, you need to write a prefix, 259-6184. And to discuss with me, the most important mode of communication between you and me will be the email. So you can write me email using my email address given here. You can also see details of myself in my home page which is given here. The lectures will be all video and they will be all uploaded one by one obviously so that you can see them at your own pace. Time of the lectures will be given as soon as the semester begins. When you use material for you because you are going to see it from your home or wherever the places you are in. Just like anything in the world happening, there must be an objective or there must have several objectives of this course. And so the basic objective of this course is to have uh, an overview of nanomaterials and that means their structure and how to characterize them. Seeing is believing, but other than seeing also there are many ways of characterizing them. So nanomaterials are important, hence at the end of the course, you should have an understanding of the properties of nanomaterials because of the small size. And lastly, we must be able to relate the various properties like biological, ionic, electric, magnetic, optical, and mechanical properties of these new set of materials with structure and also the performance. So in a nutshell, as the semester will come to end in 2020, November, December, you will have an idea of what is a nanomaterial, what are their properties, and how to relate these properties with structure. And in this, the characterization will come into a picture because you need to know how to see them, how to characterize them, how to understand their basic structures. How are we going to go about it? 
The brief outline of the course is given in this slide. As I said, this is a 40 lecture course. So first 20 lectures will be spent on basic things of nanomaterials. First, I will talk about overview of nanostructures and nanomaterial and this overview is basically related to uh, various things like how nanostructure materials came up okay historically as well as you know structurally and what are the basic features of nanomaterials then i'll talk about some of the multi scale high hierarchical structures of nanomaterials which are available in nature even let's think of bone okay human bone or any other bone it is has hierarchical structure starting from small atomic level to a macroscopic level. Similarly, many other things you can think about a conch shell is mostly made up of some calcium carbonate type materials, but the way these calcium carbonate crystals are built in to make a very tough but strong conch shell is what makes them one of the most important material in the world. Well, as you know, we need to know also some basic things like thermodynamics, surfaces, interfaces of nanostructure materials. Nanostructure materials for the surface and interfaces are very important for the nanostructure materials and this can be linked with thermodynamics. So, I will spend about 10 lectures on that and 10 lectures on the structure and the, and the hierarchical, hierarchical things. I will be giving a lot of examples from nature or man-made materials for that. So, that is the almost half of this course. Second half of the course will be on properties. Okay. Properties means mechanical, magnetic, you know, electric, electronic, photonic, many, many such properties or even bio properties. We will be discussing some of them. Obviously, we cannot discuss all of them because of time constraint, but I like to maximizes as much as possible. So, that will be our basic outline of the course, but you know as any course we need textbooks, we need to have some material to study with it. So, this is what I am showing you here, these are the recommended reading I would say, you need to follow them, these are available in our library, you can download even or if you do not get you can actually ask me, I can send you also by email or something, we will try to build even repository of these materials in the course website. The first one is by Dieter Volat. name of the book is Nanomaterials and Introduction to Synthesis, Properties and Applications. This is a very small book, but very important I am going to show you here. This is very, very uh, you know, useful book also. The next one is by Professor Mike Asby, P. J. Ferreira and D. L. Shodek. This is a very important book. This book is known as Nanomaterials, Nanotechnologies and Design and I am going to follow this book quite a lot. So, basically that means you need to read it thoroughly, that is what is it is. This book contains many things, uh, well this book has starting from the basic uh, nanomaterials in natural world to how to design make them synthesis techniques and how to understand their properties. Even you can see how the cost and other things are done in this uh, area of materials. So, we will be discussing some of these aspects. Third one is by Professor Katie Romes, name of the book is Nanomaterials, Mechanics and Mechanism. The book is mostly talk, uh, we will discuss about mechanical properties of nanomaterials and hence when I will talk about mechanical properties, I will bring in this book. But some of these aspects are also available in the book by Michael Asby. And lastly, if you are really interested to know about nanomaterials, you know, it is better to look at Encyclopedia. Encyclopedia of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, edited by Professor Hari Singh Nalwa, is a basically a mammoth. Uh, it is information available which you can refer it for anything you want. For mostly for day to day understanding of the subject you may not need it, but if you really want to 
want to know the subject and you know want you are an avid reader. So, I suggest you get this book, this is also available online. Okay, so, let me just show you some of the book things. So, these are the two books which I will uh, I will use widely, these are marked by yellow color text. This is the first uh, second book rather by Michael Asby, you see here nanomaterials, nanotechnologies and design and uh, introduction for the engineers and the architects, very interestingly also for the architects people should know how to use nanomaterials for various applications. So, this is the second one and this is the first one by Professor Dieter Pollard. So, both these two books will be the main stay for our course. So, it is better you can get a copy of these books at your disposal, so that you do not need to you know struggle during the uh, lectures, understanding your lectures. Although I will try to explain as much as possible, but you know book is always better than anything else. So, this is the third one by K T Ramas, mechanics and mechanisms of nanomaterials and the fourth one is the volume one of encyclopedia nanoscience and nanotechnology by Hari Singh Nalwa. Okay. And the course website is this, it will maintain the lattice side of our department. You can get many informations of this, I will try to put the videos also on this course website, otherwise we will put it some in some repository, I will send the links for that also. So, in a nutshell I should tell you that you know you should not run away, you know this is a very important saying running away from any problem only increase the distance from the solution. We are here engineers to find solutions of the problems humanity is facing just like COVID 19. A lot of scientists, doctors, nurses, even engineers working on to find solutions. Okay. As you can see that I am using a mask which is engineering product. So, I need to put it as close as possible on my nose that is it. So, that means, if you want to solve the problem you cannot make a distance between problem and you, you need to get close to the problem to solve it. The easiest way to escape the problem is to solve it, that is what is it. So, the easiest way to, to know a subject is to read, understand and do that. So, let us enjoy the nano world and I like to see, I like to rather recommend you to see this movie, Honey I Sunk the Kids. It's a very important movie in which the kids will become smaller because of some accident and then they will wander around in the garden of the house and finally, they will they'll be facing a lot of struggles because of the small size or nano size. They are not basically nano size, but they are small size and compared to human. So, this movie is available on YouTube, okay, that is what it is. And I do not know whether I should discuss about this slide or not in front of you right now, but this is what I use for evaluation, evaluation of your performance in the course, how to evaluate okay, a student. So, normally, we do a mid semester exam and end semester exam and quizzes, I am not sure. And we used to use earlier a class attendance as an important percentage of marks. I will discuss it when the semester will begin at the time how to go about it. I am still not sure how we can arrange these exams. So, there is no clarity yet. So, let us not discuss about it. Okay, so, that is about the introduction of the course which you have got some idea uh, how what is the course, how we can go about it. So, now I will go to the some part of the course which we are going to teach correct. Let us discuss about that. You know this course is about nanomaterials, nano is a prefix here, the nano word means dwarf, okay. all of you know uh, meaning of this word. Okay. So, let me uh, write it out D W A R F that is the meaning of word nano in Greek, this is the prefix which used for all kinds of things. But you know it has become so famous in today's world, we see nano word is used for many things like you have iPod nano, this because it is basically small machine which can allow you to 
listen music or you can have you know nano cafe you can have a small car known as tata nano you can have also logitech mouse known as a vx nano or you can even have wine named after nano correct this is very very widely used to word if you search in google you will find many many such things which in which nano word is used but you know what is it that's what you should know so in the course of this lecture hopefully you will understand what is it but let us start first how it started you know it is very important we know the history i know many of you do not like and whenever i give lecture and i started bringing history people started talking about it why to talk about history talk about future you know future is born in the womb of past okay so whatever happened in the past that actually propelled things to go into the future so it's more important to know that in this connection let me go back to the nobel laureate professor richard finman in 1959 in the annual meeting of american physical society he gave a lecture and in the lecture he talked about something which became a very important what he talked about is this like this given in the uh, you know in what it comes this is not my words his words i'm quoting it what i want to talk about is the problem of manipulating and controlling things on a small scale what are the limitations as to how small a thing has to be before you can no longer mold it look at the question how many times when you are working on something frustratingly tiny like your wife's wrist watch have you said to yourself if i could train an ant to do this work what i would like to suggest is the possibility of training an ant to train a mice to do that a friend of mine is given the name albert r hips suggest a very interesting possibility of relatively small machines he says that all that is a very wild idea it would be interesting in surgery if you can swallow your surgeon you put the mechanical surgeon inside your blood vessel it goes into the heart and looks around it finds out which valve is faulty one and takes a little knife to slice it out i have changed a little bit but this is how what is said so you understand this is a dream in 1959 1959 is 70 years ago almost no 60 years ago sorry 60 years ago today is 2020 20, 60 more than 60 years ago and that is what is dream and the dream actually makes you realize whatever you are thinking today you can do it tomorrow or not so he was talking about a tiny surgeon which can go inside your body and do that those of you who in a childhood have seen a character called doraemon japanese cartoon character you could have seen doraemon can create a small doraemon if he has a problem inside his robotic machine and that smaller one can go inside and make a repair so that was actually dreamt up by richard film in 1959 but you know nano technology came much later only in 1974 by japanese scientist dr norio taniguchi okay he coined the term nano technology you know what he referred to he referred to the precise and accurate tolerances required for machining and finishing of materials if you want to machine a surface and give a finishing touch you will be del dealing with the kind of tolerances which you can accommodate based on the specification of the customer like if you are talking about tolerances of machine tolerances of your watch okay it will be very very small machine tolerances he was talking about machine tolerances of very small of the order of hundreds of nanometers we'll come to it what is nanometer then only you'll understand it so that's how dentally came but you know it was in 1981 professor k e dexler he is at nanotech institution of molecular manufacturing in us first he talked about bottom up approaches and that is how the nanotechnology came into picture but only when in 1990s nanomaterials and nanotechnology became a popular topic of research and that's how the major inventions 
did take place. And then last 20 years in the 21st century, something more happened. So therefore, this subject is relatively new, although it, is, it has been thought about it long before, but it is new. But I'd like to show you something else also. Okay, let's talk about it. You know, we metallurgists, we are dealing with metals and alloys and ceramics and something else, all these things. We knew about nanomaterials even before that. Okay, how? You may be wondering, you are wondering about it. You know, Richard Feynman is a, is a very tall figure in this physics and even in, in various subjects. But you know, metallurgists were doing silent, silently something. What is that? In you know, in, in the beginning of 20th century, something around 1910, 1908, 1911, the alloy called duralumin came into picture, aluminum copper alloys. And these alloys are now workhorse of the aerospace industry, basically plain body and many other things are made of that. Why? Because they have very strong material, very light material. Aluminum is very low dense, but at the same time very strong. You had only 4.5 percent copper into aluminum to get duralumin. And what is so interesting about it, I'll show you that. First, let us talk about copper beryllium alloys, which are similar type but not used. When you do age hardening treatment of that, what you create is basically this kind of long precipitates. And this is reported by Price and Kelly in Acta Metallurgica 1963, just four years after the, disc, the lecture by Professor Richard Finman. You can see this dimension of these precipitates are actually some micron, less than a micron. One micron is a 10 to the minus 6 meter. So these are actually uh, plates of gamma phase formed in a matrix. Now I even go back. This was published in March 1963. Maybe same time, similar time scale as Professor Richard Friedman's lecture by Nicholson, Thomas, Gareth Thomas and John Harding. And you know, you can see here, this picture is taken at 80,000 to 100,000 times of magnification. There's no micron bar is given, but these are the precipitates which you see here very clearly. Not only that, you can see these lines which are basically nothing but a dislocation. So also if some of you are from metallurgy background, you know dislocations do exist in materials and they interact. That's how we give them strength. So now this is the precipitates around which dislocations are from loops. So dislocations are atomic scale objects. They must be as small as nanometric scale. So seeing them in a transmission microscope in 1960s, obviously was very, very, very big achievement. And because transmission electron microscope in which these images were obtained came in 1900, after Second World War actually, in the commercial scale, that is in after 1945. So these objects you see here basically are precipitates in a matrix of aluminum. This is aluminum, zinc, magnesium alloy. Okay, this is AL actually, not A1. So what I mean to say is that these were there, the subject was there, but we never explored it. We never given them as a nano precipitate or nanoscale objects. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, what is a nanomaterial, by the way? I've given you some historical perspectives. Many people do not like historical perspectives. Let us go back into the subject. What is a nanomaterial? You know, this is a picture of late nanoparticles in, on a transmission electron microscope. So what you see here, there is a distance bar, this distance here you see here, this distance is 100 nanometer. Now that length is 100 nanometer. So I can use that, this is a linear scale, I can use that and measure the size of this, diameter of the each of this particle, diameter of this, diameter of this, diameter of this, diameter of that, I can do that. And if I measure them, I will find all of them will fall below 100 nanometer. Now, question for you is, what is nanometer? Okay, one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So, that means, if I divide one meter by 10 to the power minus 9 times. So, uh, what is then that? So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's one billion. Okay, so one billion 
if we divide one meter into one billion small objects, one small object is one nanometer. Thus, one nanometer is equal to 10 to the power minus 9 meter. On the other hand, micron, which you have heard a lot, is something like this. One micrometer is 10 to the power minus 6 meter. And all of you know that one millimeter is 10 to the power minus 3 meter. So, that is the relationship. So, one millimeter, one micrometer, one nanometer, you are going down the scale. And every time you are doing down three orders of magnitude in scale. So, any object has three dimensions x, y, z and any of these dimensions having a distance uh, less than about say less than about 100 nanometers is called a nanometrial. That is what is the definition of nanometrial. So, this, this pen also has three directions x, y, z and any of this direction if you have the dimension of less than 100 nanometers. 100 nanometer means what? 10 to the minus 7 meter, right? If any of this dimension has that, then we call them nanometrials. It need not to be that all the dimension x, y, z must have less than 100 nanometer, but it can be only one of the dimensions. That is what is important to know. So, nanoscale means size varying from 1 to 100 nanometers, correct? So, nano objects means materials with 1, 3 or 2 external dimension, I, think I mean to say x, y, z is in the nano scale object uh, design and it is called nano material nano objects. Particle is same thing, okay. So, it can be nano fiber, nano tube, nano rod, nano wire, nano plate, nano quantum dots, uh, sorry quantum dots, anything. You can only you need to write a nano prefix before plate, before fiber, before tube, before rod, before wire. That is it. There are thousands of such things available now. So, that means, uh, you know, nanometric size range is important and that any of the dimension x, y, z can be the dimension. Let us give some examples of that. You know, gold, silver are very precious metals. They are liked by the ladies. Uh, in India so much. Everybody wants to have a gold ring around uh, in, in their fingers or gold bracelet. So, gold can be made nanoscale. You see this is a nanometric object. This is 5 nanometer dimension. So, that means this is of the order of 7 nanometer size. Silver this is 2 nanometer dimension. So, this means this is about say about how many 20 nanometers. This is silver nanoparticle. You can see there are a lot of things inside. In fact, this in the gold each dot corresponds to column of atoms actually, they are taken at a such a high resolution. You can also have tip of a atom probe microscope or scanning tunnels microscope in nanometric domain. Okay, this is the tip you can see here shown in this white square box. You can also have nanotubes, you can see that this is the carbon nanotubes, bunch of carbon nanotubes and this is tube, how do you know? Because you can see there is a hole. So, this tube will have only a hole inside it and then something surrounding it. So, that is what is atomic layer surrounding the holes, that is what is called nanotubes. There are so many nanotubes are present here. Well, you can also have catalyst, you know, all the catalyst which are used in the auto industry or so has precious metal like platinum, palladium, silver, gold as a nanoscale. But platinum, platinum, silver, gold is very expensive, so people use silver. So, you can clearly see that silver atoms are lined up in a, in a present in a matrix. This is the steps. The steps are good because they will act as a site for the reaction which is for which they are made up actually. Maybe this is to convert carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, NOx to nitrogen. So, this is what they are used. So, there and for catalyst all throughout the 100 centuries this is what is used. Okay. So, let us be just talk about the scale. As we discussed ant and mites, dust mite already in the Professor Richard Friedman's statements. So, you know they are centimeter scale, ants actually centimeter scale. 
You can see by naked eyes moving around on the floor of your house, right? Dust mites, which you may not see it, but if it falls on your skin, it makes itching kind of things on your skin. They are a couple of hundred nanometers, 200 nanometers or 300 nanometers like that. Sorry, micrometer, not nanometers. So from centimeters, we have gone to a couple of hundred micrometers. Human hair, very thin, you can hold by your hand. Okay, but its diameter is something around 60 to 120 micrometer, depending on quality of hair you have. If your hair is every, you know, falling rapidly, then your thickness of hair will be small, because they are not growing much. If you have a good hair, that means hair staying in your head for long, then it will be thicker. So, 80 to 129 micrometer is possible. You know, flyers, like all the coal fire power plants, they generate a lot of flyers. This flyer is actually very small, tiny particles. These particles actually can fly long distances because they're massless almost. So they are having dimensions of, you know, micron size. Well, if you go down a little bit, so these are actually hundreds of microns, right? 60, 120, or maybe some 200 microns. If you go down on one order magnitude, that is 6 to 7 microns, these are all red blood cells which carry oxygen from lungs to the different parts of the body, correct? Still, if you go down several scale let smaller, the basic structure of our body or any living being is the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. That dimension is of the order of 2 to 3 nanometers, I have already explained. And if you still go down the atomic level, what is it happen actually? Level is a silicon. Silicon, distance between two dumbbells actually in silicon, dumbbells means two atoms, is about 7.8 Armstrong. So, on Armstrong is 10 to the minus 10 meters, that is what is written here, and 1 nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meter. So, that means what? 1 nanometer is 10 Armstrong, and Armstrong is the unit which is used in atomic scale dimensions. So, this is the length scale we are talking about it, and you should, I think, I hope you have now a complete picture how the length scales actually, you know, varies and how we can look at it. Now, this is, this is also a very important concept which you should understand. Well, as you go down the size from centimeter to millimeter to micrometer to nanometers or even atomic scale, the surface area increases. How it happens? Let us, let us do a simple mass. Okay, let us take a cube whose side, each side is one centimeter. So that means cube has six sides. So, if each side is 1 centimeter, the area of each face is 1 centimeter square. So, total area of the cube is 6 centimeter square because 6 is the total number of surfaces it has. So, now let us do a simple, uh, you know, geometrical construction. Suppose let us break the cube into 1 millimeter cube and there will be many, many such cubes possible, correct. And actually, you will have about 60 such cubes, and uh, sorry, not 60, more than that. If it is 1 millimeter, if it is 1 millimeter, okay, so each 1 millimeter cube will have 1 millimeter square area, right? And as you know, so 1 centimeter is about 100 millimeters. So, if you do a mass properly, the surface area of these main, these so many cubes which will produce will have about 60 centimeter square. So, that means if you reduce this dimension of the cube without changing the volume for 1 centimeter to be consisting of many, many, many cubes of 1 millimeter, then you are its surface area is increasing by 10 times. So, what happens if you go down to nanometer scale? Surface area will be decreased by 10 to the power 7 times, 16 10 to the power 7 centimeter square will be the surface area if you make cube each is a dimension of 1 nanometer, volume is same. So, you can imagine that that is what happens if you make a material to the nanometric scale. And the nanometric scale surface area will increase extensively. So, larger the surface area, larger will be items on the surfaces and their characteristics will change. 
So that's what actually happens when you go down the sides. And this gives you many, many interesting possibilities. Well, you can do it for a you know, sphere, same thing. I'm not going to do it. Suppose you have a sphere of radius of R0, a volume is V0. Basically, V0 is equal to 4 by 3rd, 4 by 3 pi R0 is cube. Now, if you divide into many, many small cubes, okay, many small cubes of volume V1, where V1 is equal to 4 by 3 pi R1 cube. Okay. So, you will see this is the relationship volume will remain constant, V0 is equal to NV1, correct. Now, if you do a simple math, you will find that this relationship that VB, volume of this uh, you know, change actually, A, a constant V0 by R1 into T. Okay. And A is a constant, okay. T is basically thickness thickness will have some mass if you do a proper mathematics that will also going to happen. So, that means what? A is a geometrical constant, whether it is a sphere or a cube that will change, but it is basically B G that what does it tell? Okay, let me just change the color of this pen. Okay, it tells you B B by B 0 is equal to 1 by R 1. So, as you decrease the R 1, the ratio of surface area of these droplets divided by surface area of these bigger droplets is increasing okay, very rapidly. So, if we can think of this way, if I consider that the atom sitting on the surfaces is given by the volume, okay, so here V0 and here Vb, all addition of that. So, basically Vb is nothing but summation of all Vi's, where I's go to 1 to n, right. And it's here is basically all the same sizes. So, this is nothing but n v 1. So, you can see that actually. That's, that's the simple maths you can do it and understand that by simply breaking into smaller pieces, you can create larger surface area. This can be put in a plot. So, as you see here, this is the y axis your radius. That's our r 1 in nanometric scale 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 and this is y x axis your volume fraction of the atom sitting on the surface. So, 0 0.1 means 10 percent, 0 0.4 means 40 percent, 0 0.9 means 90 percent. So, you can clearly see when you have a size of, of the order of 5 nanometers or 4 nanometer size almost about 90 percent atoms are sitting on the surface. So, in the bulk very less amount of atoms are sitting. So, therefore, when the number of atoms sitting on the surface is increasing rapidly, uh, very large fractions, the properties are also going to be changed. But if you have a size of about say 20 to 30 nanometers, only 10 percent of them sitting on the surface. So, that is a drastic change if you go down from 50 to about 4 nanometers or 5 nanometers. That is very interesting. And you know, so atom sitting on the surface will have a lot of dangling bonds, which we will discuss anyway when you are talking about surface interfaces. And these dangling bonds are not satisfied. So, their behavior of the atoms will be different compared to the sitting of the atoms sitting inside the surface. So, uh, you know, when your material's dimensions is micron size, okay, 1 to 10 microns, that is what you see in normal materials, okay, which you see like steels or cast irons or maybe alumina or polymers, they always show the bulk properties because number of atoms sitting on the surface is very, very small. They do not contribute much to the properties of the material. Only atoms since sitting inside the inside the bulk, they are dictating the properties. But as you decrease down the size of the particle to 100 nanometer or lower, then you see the surface atoms dominating the properties of the material. They are dictating the properties of the material. That is why these domain is called as a surface energy dominated properties. But still if you go down to 1 to 2 nanometers, very very small size, then it is no longer surface energy, it is quantum confinement. Okay, we will discuss about these, we will talk about electronic properties. Quantum mechanics comes in the picture. You can confine the electrons by quantizing the energy levels. So, this is what is shown here. So, if I have a bulk, if I plot energy versus reciprocal lattice vectors, you see energy will increase like this. Okay, that we know square 
actually g over g3 squared. But if you have thin films, very small thin films, you have a step function of energy. It was initially like this, now it is becoming step. Correct. But things will happen, they are still different when you have a nano dimension of these thin films or like wire or plates. So then you see that this kind of energy level, discrete energy levels will come. And when you have a very small one to nanometers, then their discretion is very, 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 very large discretion happens. So that means at each energy level, you will have electrons. Okay. That's nothing but the concept has come from the particle in box theory, which you have studied in your physics in plus two or maybe in the first year of engineering or in MSc. Correct. So now the question is this, as I discussed, let me just bring this concept also before we uh, stop this lecture today. As I said, physically any object will have three dimension x, y, z, but in order to become a nanomaterials, all the dimension need not be nanometric scale. If only one dimension out of x, y, z is in nanometric scale, okay, you know, only one dimension, one of these things. Okay, then we call a three dimensional material, correct? Correct, like in a grain, if one of the dimension is nanometric, it is called that. If you have one out of three dimensions x, y, z to a nanometric scale, like a plate is shown here, okay. You see in the plate, thickness x, y, z, three dimensions that x and y are nanometric, but z is, z is not, okay. So, because G is not x, y only nanometric scale, uh, are in nanometric scale then it is called two dimension. You can also have lot of laminates stacking each other, you can see here 1, 2, 3, 4, white, red, white, red stacks and you see only the thickness of this red color thing is small. So, that means only one of the dimension thickness not x, y only g of that is nanometric, it is called one dimension. Okay? And you can have zero dimensional objects when all the directions x, y, z are in nanometric, that is a quantum dots. Quantum dots is nothing but a small size object in which any dimension is nanometric scale. So, that is the typical way of characterizing dimension of nanomet nanomaterials, you understand that? And this is how things are actually dealt in the literature. But not only this, you can also have many other ways of doing that, which we will discuss later. So, what is important is one part is nanomaterial, but what is important is nanotechnology, you know. What is nanotechnology? You know, it is understanding and manipulation or control of the matter in the dimensions of 1 to 100 nanometers, okay. And as you have, I have already discussed, a lot of new things can happen, expected to happen in a nanometer scale. So, it is this aspect, the manipulation, control at the nanoscale is known as nanotechnology, okay. And you know that encompassing nanoscale science, engineering technology, nanotechnology, it can involve many things, it can involve imaging, measuring, modeling, manipulating matters and land scales or even creating things, okay. So, that is what is called as altogether nanotechnology. So, you can bring this science into a product, into a things which are useful. A lot of such things available in real markets, okay necessarily and also man-made. So, many such products are there, I will not discuss about that, okay. No, I will only discuss one of them, you know what is known as TiO2 nanoparticles, okay. What is they? Okay, titanium nano dioxide TiO2 is found in many products. It can be found in spray, it can found it even your sunscreen, you can find it in your medicines. Okay, this is nothing but a very useful material in the real world. But you know, to give you perspectives, if you move on the road, you see there are white markers of the roads. Okay, they are sometimes used to, you know, make different road signs. But if you if you use simple chalk to make a white mark on the road, and because of the pollution, auto exhaust. Or, or various exhaust from various plants nearby, they can create various polluting agents, suits or carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, NOx, they can actually fall on the surfaces of these 
and cover it and even discolor these white marks correct so again you have to mark it and loads are thousands of kilometers long it is not easy to do that it is very expensive so instead of that if we can use a material uh, to print on the roads and that material itself can have a self healing property what is the meaning of that that means it can take care of itself when there is a damage so when titanium dioxide nanoscale actually does the same way so if you look at it if i put white titanium dioxide on a road as a marker and in presence of sunlight it can actually oxidizes this carbonaceous materials so that they can become gas and go away so that is exactly what is used correct so light in presence of light they can act as a catalyst that's why they are called photo catalyst photo means light so they can catalyze in presence of light and oxidize these carbonaceous materials in the air so this is just one example you know to take it out you could you have heard lot of advertisements in, in the tv and in the news media uh, or even internet that if you coat your house with some paints it doesn't get discolored it doesn't get uh, you know bad as the time goes on so that you do you don't you need to repaint them repaint means you have to paint again okay but if you use this then nano titanium dioxide on the outside the wall of the house same thing will happen pollution will not change the color of the of the or the whatever you are using on the outside uh, walls of your house correct so that is why these paints are very famous so you can use that same thing you can do it uh, in your what is as sunscreen sunscreen protects you from sun right so you apply a sunscreen on your screen sunlight should not damage your screen correct so these uh, objects if you apply on it it can actually create a layer that layer can oxidize many of these harmful things and not only that it can also protect you from uv lights by various means so that's why it is used widely this is one such example so that means from scientific concept to technology to the product it is very important to sustain the growth of any field and this is exactly will be taught to you in, the, in this course so with this let me stop it here i have spoken about 45 minutes or so the last 5 minutes i have kept it open to know about you in the first lecture so that we can discuss uh, with each other and know each other thank you